Well, hello out there, everybody. Welcome to A Real Point of View. You know, it's been a while since we've been here. It has been a time where the world is going like the world is going. Um, uh, COVID comes in and knocks everything out of, out of kilter. So we've had a pretty long hiatus, but you know what? We're back. We're back Yay. and we're back to fight. And, oh, I'm sorry, that was something else. Okay. <laughs> but we're back. Welcome back to A Real Point of View. So now we're going to talk about movies again, once again. And joining me today is one of my cohorts, Miss Karen D., otherwise known as the Movie Maven. How are you doing, Karen? So happy to be back, Greg. I know, right? Yeah, it has, this is, it, this is, I really missed us doing this. Yeah, and I, and I miss us doing this. And in, with that being said, we have two other of our partners who are not here today. Um, so we want to get a shout out to Larry and a shout out to Steve and uh, um, hope that everything's going okay. And in this uh, time of COVID and, and, and the pandemic, um, we want every blessing to be out there. So we're putting it out there. Blessing to you guys. Yep, absolutely. All right. So this has been a very impactful week, um, personally for me and to some degree, but also in the world of film. Uh, today's episode is about one of those iconic, um, brilliant actors, um, a man who has, I don't know how the best way to describe it, who has superseded expectation. He is uh, one of the best actors I've ever watched, um, a great individual and personally outside of the, the industry, just a, a great person. And that's in the um, person of Sidney Portier. So Sidney Portier passed recently and we wanted to just give him a, a, a shout out also. Um, so Karen, anything about Sidney Portier that um, hit you up front? Sure. I mean, his mark on the film industry is immeasurable, in my opinion. From the unlikeliest of sources, he became one of the most amazing film stars that has ever graced the screen. He came from the Bahamas, and, you know, this story's been given a lot of attention because of his recent recent passing earlier this earlier in the month of January. But I mean he came from the Bahamas, he came from poor beginnings. His family wanted a better life and they sent him to live with a brother in Miami. He didn't really like Miami that very much, so he ended up going to New York and got very menial jobs. I mean at one point he was sleeping in a in like a bus station toilet. That's where he slept. So we're talking, you know, profound poverty here. And he had like these really menial jobs, janitor, dishwasher, whatever. Um, he just happened to go to an American Negro theater audition. And I don't know how he got in, but he got in and, you know, auditioned for a part and was completely awful. I mean, like, whoa, like this <laughs> is like newsworthy awful. It's so bad. Such a thick accent, so, you know, having no idea of what to do, blah, 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 blah. They're like, get out of here. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't even come back. He was so, but instead of being crushed by that, as I think I would have been, um, he's like, okay, I'm, I'm beating this. So he spent the next, like, six months intensely studying English and listening to people so that he could moderate his accent or eliminate it as much as possible. He went back to the American Negro Theater Ensemble like about six months later, got a part. Little part, but he got a part. And he was so good in that that he got notice um, from some agents because American Negro Theater Ensemble, especially in the 40s, was huge. That was Black Broadway. Because regular Broadway, I mean, you would see actors of color on on the regular, quote unquote, great white way, but you 
you wouldn't see them nearly to the extent that you would see them at the American Negro Theater Ensemble. And you, and you certainly wouldn't see portrayal of stories about people of color. Mm-hmm. So, but Broadway producers, if they needed a person of color, if they, if, and if they were looking for new talent and they wanted to find somebody who in those days was Negro, they would go to the American Negro Theater Ensemble. That's, that was the farm team. Mm-hmm. So someone saw him there and gave him a bit part in Lysistrata, and he was really good. And from that, the rest, as they say, was his, is history. He, he, um, Zana sort of got, had, got his eye on him, and he was cast in his first movie called No Way Out. He was co-starring with Richard Widmark, and this movie was really visceral. I mean, very unstinting look at like race relations. I mean, like if you look at movies, I'm sorry, if you look at, I'm about to go on a rant here. If you look at movies on the Hallmark Channel, even Lifetime, the way in which they tiptoe around race relations and the amity that can sometimes result you would think that there has never been an issue with racism in this country. But in those days, the N-word was used Mm -hmm. and, you know, the, you know, the, the hostility was palpable. So in No Way Out, you had Sidney Poitier played a doctor, which, you know, again, pretty unusual, but he played like an intern. And Richard Widmark plays this guy who brings his brother in. He's been critically injured. And Sidney Poitier is like the guy on duty, the doctor on duty. So, you know, it's like, okay, well, I will treat your brother. And and Richard Widmark's like, you're not putting your hands on my brother, you, you know, N-word and everything Mm -hmm. but a child of God. There's no way in hell you're touching my brother. You don't know what you're doing. What are you, kind of a witch doctor? Blah, blah, blah. You know, anyway, just complete visceral hatred, you know. Mm -hmm which they did not shy away from. And I will throw this in there. During the filming, (laughs) Richard Widmark was mortified by his character. So (laughs) during the filming, you know, when they were, when the camera stopped rolling, he was, he found himself profusely apologizing to Sidney Poitier for being so mean to him. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> when the cameras were rolling because he just that was what his character was always like I'm not that guy I'm not that guy uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but anyway but Sidney Poitier did a fabulous job in No Way Out and from there he's just gotten more and more roles and he became like this bankable likable interesting person um that was that had a love affair with the camera and the, the camera loved him back, and he had like this grace and this presence that made people want to watch him, made people interested in what in what he was going to do next. And it wasn't it wasn't because he always played a nice guy. Sometimes he didn't play a nice guy, or he had a guy with a temper. Um, you know, so there, you know, it wasn't he didn't. I mean, he was criticized during during his you know stay in, in film for being for playing too much of like the milk toast or the nice guy or the whatever but his his characters even the nice people always to me always had an edge to them or there mm-hmm. was just like a hint of an edge with the possible exception of lilies of the field which we will talk about but but generally speaking there was that little bit of edge with his characters so you knew there was something else going on there. Mm-hmm. And even if he was being nice, it wasn't because he was stupid or it wasn't because, you know, he didn't know that he, that, that people were trying to, you know, take advantage of him. It was because you could see his character choosing to take the high road. Right. And that, so that, and it's like, okay, well, why did, you know, he had every single right to just come out of a bag on these people. Why did he choose to take the high road? And so you stayed to watch to find out what's going on. What, what is, what is he drinking that keeps him above the fray? Mm -hmm. So to me that, you know, that was, that was interesting. And, you know, and then the other thing was that he was very careful about the roles he chose. He, did not, I mean, he refused to, I think there was, 
there was some role where he was offered, I'm pretty sure he was offered a role where he, um, maybe he was like the criminal charged with like sexually assaulting a woman. And, and he's like, I'm not doing that. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. So he didn't. So the roles that he picked were very carefully chosen by him and, and his team of people um, because he understood how precious his presence on the screen was and the legacy that was involved. And also, I think he intuitively understood long before it became a buzzword on the internet that film is forever, mm -hmm. you know? So it's not just about what he's doing and what he's getting paid for. It's about what his children are going to see and his grandchildren and great grand grandchildren are going to see. What are they right. going to see when they look at him? Mm -hmm. They're going to see a man of great honor. They're going to see a man of great integrity. They're going to see a man of vision. He graced, he made America a better country. He made American film better. He made the world a better place. He, he did that. So I'm thrilled that we can, you know, dedicate this episode to Sidney Poitier. Awesome. That was awesome. And just to interject uh, from one of our team members that is not here with us today, um, this is from Larry Domkowski, the must-see movie critic, uh, what he said about Sidney Poitier. Sidney Poitier was one of the Hollywood's elites and an important voice in the civil rights movement. movement. Uh, he was a great actor, a great influencer, and someone who carried himself and the cause he represented with strength and dignity. Um, he just made the world a better place. And that, that's, that's a nice sub summation uh, of Sidney Poitier. So thanks, Larry, for that. Appreciate that. But also, in context of what you were saying, Karen, that just made sense. And I wanted to just mention this that I found um, from Sidney Poitier. Poitier um, if the fabric of society were different, I would scream to the high heavens to play villains and or deal with different images of Negroes that would be more uh, dimensional. But I'll be damned if I do that on the stage in, at this point in the game. Not when there is only one Negro actor working in film with any degree of consistency. So as you alluded to, picking the right things, the right films, the right situations at where he was in the times. And that was like in 1967, I think when he- uh, Vision. The man that. had vision. He did, very much so. So let me ask you a question. What was your favorite film or films of Sidney Poitier that you, that spoke to you? Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Let me talk about my favorite film. Okay. And it's my favorite film. It's such a favorite film of mine that I have the original movie poster of that film on my wall. Can you guess what that movie is? It's not Little Nikita? No. <laughs> Which he was in, by the way. Yes, okay. he was, but no. <laughs> um, was it To Sir With Love? No. In the was Heat it... of the Night. Okay, so that's that's funny because I I um, as you well know, Karen, I'm a big fan of that movie. Uh, and do you have the original movie poster? Because I have that. <laughs> no, because you have it. They only made one. Okay, but yeah, that, that that's probably for me one of my favorite. I mean, I, there's a quite a few of them that I like, but that one moment where he and Rod Steiger are having their introductory to each other is to me what makes the movie and takes you throughout the rest of the film in this back and forth uh, um, uh, duel, we should say, between them, not just the duel uh, of Diablo, but, <laughs> but which is another film, uh, but uh, this confrontation between he and Rod Steiger 
in the heat of the night. That is awesome. And it's just, it's, a, it's the epitome of people not, people judging a book by, by its cover and not judging the person and not seeing, seeing past the person and not seeing the person. And, and it's just, it's an iconic moment in that film. And if you don't know anything about Sidney Poitier at the time, you love that moment. And I don't care who you are, you love that moment because it's a moment of strength, calm, and defiance on one moment. It's, a, it's, just, it's awesome. So I can see why that would be on your wall. That makes sense. Well, let's start from the beginning for those of us in our audience who may have no idea what we're talking about. What is this movie? Um, thank God it hasn't been remade. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> they, they so got it right the first time. This movie was, was, um, was made in 1967, or that's when it was seen, that's when it was released, I'm sorry, released in 1967, in the heat of the night. As Gregory said, Sidney Poitier and Rod Steiger starred in this movie. It was directed by Norman Jewison. And um, this movie is just classic Sidney Poitier. Gloria D. Haven was also in this movie. Um, Ray Charles sang the title song in the heat of the night and just knocked that out of the park. But here's, here's the premise of the story. Sidney Poitier is a, is a detective from Philadelphia. His family lives in the South. He goes to, I guess it's Mississippi, mm -hmm. some Sparta, Mississippi. He goes to Sparta, Mississippi to visit his mother. And visit goes fine and he's on his way back. He's waiting at the train station for the train because we weren't allowed to on airplanes in those days. So he's waiting on, on, at the train station for the train. He gets arrested for murder. He's like, what are you talking about? No, you know, this, you know, this man was murdered and, and some idiot cop thought he must have done it. And the idiot cop, I believe, was played by Warren Oates. That's correct. Another just amazing, just stunning actor. But anyway, <laughs> so, so they arrest him, you know, for waiting for a train while black and bring him into the <laughs> station. <laughs> <laughs> and that is where that iconic moment between Rod Steiger as the sheriff of Sparta and Sidney Poitier as this Philadelphia detective happens. And but Rod Rod Steiger is even I mean, yeah, the man's a racist, there's no doubt about that. But he's also a good cop. And at the end of the day, he he's not interested in being embarrassed by bringing stupid cases to the you know state's attorney or to the district attorney to get laughed out. So he wants to he wants to make sure the cases are tied up with a bow. Mm -hmm. So he starts asking Warren Oates some basic questions about, you know, well, that really get back to what and what was the evidence again that caused you to arrest <laughs> this man? And yes, I mean, I know he's a Negro. That's the first bit of evidence. But did you have anything else? And Warren Oates is like, well, he was waiting for a train. <laughs> oh, oh okay yeah. he doesn't really articulate it but man that's the look on his face like yeah he was there he was like, yeah he was there <laughs> and and he's negro i don't know what else you want me to say here i it's mean like, that's, that seems like enough in my book it was impeccable evidence and and yeah and and he and rod steiger's like or yeah chief gillespie's like oh God, you are stupid. <laughs> right. I like, so can't get any good help here. Right. Can't get any good help. So then he so then he's looking, he's asking Sidney Poitier's, you know, Virgil Tibbs, you know, about him, you know, well, gee, what you know, what are you doing in these parts? He's like, I came to visit my family, you know, and blah, and what and what are you doing? What kind of work do you do? And blah, blah, blah and you know, and what's you know, and Virgil, what kind of name is that? That's a weird name. What is, you know, and what kind of work do you do? I'm a police detective. You're a police well, detective. It's 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 even funnier than that. Oh, it's okay. More, how, much, it, how much funnier is it? It's more. He looks at um, uh, Virgil's billfold and sees all this money, 
Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. And so he's asked him, where can a Negro get this kind of money? He said, I earned it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> which is which in itself, in that text context, in that time frame, in that city, you black people didn't talk like that. Well, they also don't earn that kind of money. They steal it. So, so they say. <laughs> so they say, right? So he's like, "Well, where can a black person, a, a Negro, earn this kind of money?" He said, "In Philadelphia." He said, "Philadelphia, Mississippi." He said, "No, pick Pennsylvania." He said, "Well, doing what?" I'm a police detective. <laughs> so you just pulled somebody like Karen alluded to, not asking no questions and find out that this is the guy who usually chases the guy that you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. It's like, did you look at his wallet? Did you look at his head? No, I just brought him in, chief. <laughs> he's like, he, he's like, Ward. <laughs> look at that. Look at that. And, and it's a badge. <laughs> well, the other part of that the other part of that thing was like well how you you make all this kind of money you know you how how this is more than three times my monthly salary he's like right. and then he's like well i'm a i'm a police detective it's like a police detective you know what and then he gets into the well you know what do they call you what what you know virgil tibbs what kind of a name is that because he just has to mock him because you know i mean already he's better dressed makes more money <laughs> has a badge shouldn't have been brought in so i i got i got some i gotta do some okay i'll mock his name because that is a kind of a funny name what kind of a name is that what do they call you up there in philadelphia pennsylvania do they call you you know virgil they call me mr tibbs you know when are, you can do it better than i can crap because i'm not a, a guy but anyway but that's just like they call me mr it's like oh it is, crap it, <laughs> and it's so funny because he's like <laughs> Well, how much did they, 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 they pay you? How much? He says, $162.50 a week, which back mm -hmm. then was humongous. He's right. like, really? He said, yeah. well, if you just call my, my superior and, and he'll, he'll, he'll vouch for me and I'll even pay for the call. Oh, you're gonna pay for the car. <laughs> <Right. laughs> I don't I don't need your your nickel for my I got a nickel. That I got. <laughs> yeah, that was I, I love that. So and, you just Ward, you just take him out. And so he calls Virgil's uh, supervisor and then he calls Virgil back. They push Virgil back in the Gillespie's office and he goes, uh yo, 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 uh Superior wants to talk to you. So he's talking to him on the phone and Virgil's like, yes, sir. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to wake you. I'm sorry. Huh? What do you mean what? you want me to help they, them? They're not, they, they won't want my help. No, I'm not prejudiced. I'm just, but they won't want my help. Mm. And then mm. Virgil's quiet. He just listens and he hands the phone back to Gillespie. And Gillespie says, oh, well, thank you for offering such a fine detective as in Virgil Tibbs, but we won't need his help. Thank you though. And then he hangs up and he says, well, here's your money. And so Virgil puts his coat on, his suit coat and starts counting his money. And he goes, Gillespie goes, well, it's all there. No, it's all there. Like, yeah. like, we, like we wouldn't steal it. <laughs> it's all no, there. No, but you'd arrest me for a murder I didn't commit. Yeah, right. okay. And so he looks at, Gillespie and starts counting again. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, puts in his wallet. And then, then so Gillespie goes, So uh your 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 chief said you are a homicide detective. And you his best homicide detective. And Virgil goes, uh-huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> while he counts his money. <laughs> right, while he's still counting the money. <laughs> <laughs> he says, so, 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 uh, and Virgil looks at him and says, so what? Maybe you uh, look at our dead body? And Virgil yeah. goes, and Virgil goes, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But here was the irony. In 1967, there was no such thing as forensics, right? 
no such thing as forensics or forensic chemistry was something by a different name. Excuse me. Yeah, it's definitely nothing that we know it like it is today. Not even close. Right. And the only person who really examined dead bodies was the coroner. Mm -hmm. Cops didn't do that. They just shipped the, they just brought in the coroner and the coroner pronounced time of death and that was that. And maybe there was an autopsy if there was foul play. But even then, nascent science at that point. Virgil Tibbs, ironically, is an expert in forensic analysis. That's how he made his bones as a detective in Philadelphia, because no one wants to deal with dead bodies, but he didn't mind. So, <laughs> so Gillespie's like, you want to look at it? He's like, no, you don't need my help. Remember, remember, let's, let's rewind to the, our earlier portion of the program when you said you didn't need my help. Right. Uh, but then they bring, they, they get to the body and here to me was another key part where, which is where Sidney Poitier is examining the body and he's looking at things that a cop would never look at, like the fingernails mm -hmm. and, you know, in between the fingers and like, you know, the mouth and, you know, the overall sheen of the body and, you know, like all of these things that a chemist would look at or that a doctor would look at. And Gillespie's like, what the hell are you doing? You know, he's like, well, I can tell by looking at these fingernails that, you know, there was a, there was something, a fight or whatever. And, you know, and, and he fought him off, but you know, that's why there's, you know, there appears to be, it's probably skin under the fingernails, yada, yada, yada. And Gillespie's like, seriously? Okay. Yeah. And, and, and so they're in the room, Gillespie's in there. <laughs> I have to go this and it to expound on what you're saying. Gillespie's in the room with the coroner and the doctor. <laughs> okay. They're looking at the body like, oh, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and, and so Gillespie <laughs> does his overview. He just kind of walks around the body, kind of looks at it. <laughs> and he looks at Virgil, who's standing over like this. <laughs> and he goes, um, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> right. And so he does all the things that Karen just that you just said. Virgil does. And the and the doctor's looking. And so he says, Doctor, so what do you think? Time of death's about 12 o'clock. <laughs> and the doctor goes, Yeah. <laughs> and the coroner's like, just mean mugging everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and so finally, Virgil does those things, and so he goes, <laughs> Keith Gillespie gets a call from the phone, and he goes, okay, well, I got to go. I, I got there. We're chasing down somebody. I got to go. And you just help Virgil. You help this man do everything he needs to get done, and he leaves. And so the doctor's looking, and the coroner's looking at Virgil, and Virgil goes, okay, who's going to help? And they look at him like, <laughs> <laughs> Help what? I ain't helping you. <laughs> they didn't say it, but the look on their face was, I ain't helping you. Who are you? I ain't helping you. Yeah. You're not even a doctor. Yeah, it was it was more I ain't helping this Negro do nothing. <laughs> helping you. You're supposed to be helping us. <laughs> right, 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 right. Exactly. 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 That, is, that, that whole movie is so you know. It, Looking at it initially, here yeah, you're going through the, all the emotions and all the things that are going through that film. Looking at it again, it's probably the same thing. But looking at it and dissecting the film and, and listening to it, as we're sitting here laughing, it's almost like it's a comedy. And it is because not it's a just comedy. It's so ridiculous. It, it I mean, is a very serious is just situation. So ridiculous, but it's a very serious, it's fraught with danger. No, no, it, doubt it about is. It. And then there, and then it gets to the point where in the movie, I know we're killing it. We're just spoiling the, the heck out of this movie. Um, well, if you haven't seen it by now. Years. It's so on we're, you. <laughs> exactly. So he finally is brought in front of one of the richest men in the county at the man's home. Oh, no, I have to tell this part. I'm just, I'm setting it up. He's at the oh. man's home because they have to ask him questions. And obviously he doesn't want to get questions from this Negro, let alone Negro detective. Take it away. 
but the here here is the setup the i the person who was killed was an industrialist a wealthy industrialist who was going to build a factory in sparta mississippi but here's the wrinkle this was going to be the first factory that was not going to require racial segregation anyone who was qualified would be able to get the job so negroes were welcome Asians were welcome, Jews were welcome, as well as the white folks. Everybody was welcome. Well, that was a problem. And this industrialist was killed. The reason that Sidney Poitier's character, Virgil Tibbs, was brought in, one of the things that convinced him to say, all right, I'll, I won't get the next train out of this hellhole, is because the wife, the widow of the industrialist, who was played by Gloria de Haven, said, you know, if somebody killed my husband, there are a bunch of yahoos in this ignorant one horse town that can't find their way to a paper bag, let alone out of a paper bag. I really need your help. You're the only intelligent person I can talk to around here. Please help me find them, find whoever killed my husband. Um, so, so Sidney Poitier is like, oh, oh okay. All right. I, I get what's what's at stake here now. So that's one of the, that's one reason why he does want to stick around because it's like you know if Negroes Negroes can't get jobs in Spar, Mississippi unless they're janitors or you know maids, these factory jobs would pay a lot of money. And you know in retrospect, so um, so that's why he's more than interested now in finding who killed this man. And he's following the evidence where it leads. And it leads to all kinds of weird places. But at some point, he finds his way around to this huge plantation, the man who basically runs the town. Now, he doesn't really run Chief Gillespie, but they're friends. It's sort of like they agree to, you know, we're, we're basically on the same side, and, and the, the plantation owner to Gillespie is like, as long as you don't get in my way, we're cool. You can do your job, and I won't oppose you for re-election as sheriff, and we'll, we'll be buddies and all that other stuff for as far as it goes. So they know each other. They're not really friends, but they're, not, but they're in they allies. They exist they're together. More like a, so there's, yeah, they're, they're aligned would be the word. Mm -hmm. They're aligned. So, so Gillespie brings in Virgil Tibbs, and Virgil Tibbs is asking this man because, you know, Gillespie doesn't really give him a heads up that he's like, oh my God, this is like the biggest man in town. This is, you know, this is like, you know, and it's a wonderful life and, and Mr. Potter, this is our Mr. Potter. Didn't give him that heads up. So, so. Virgil just walks in and questions him it's like as if they're equals. Well, where were you on the night of and blah, 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 blah. And what were you doing about this, this, that, and the other? And, and, and it just, and you could see this man just becoming more and more angry because, because Virgil Tibbs is implying that somehow he might have had something to do with this industrialist death or that at least there's some reason to suspect him now that's after this this particular child of god goes on a little soliloquy about orchids because sydney poitier saw the orchids and asked him something you know it's like oh gee you know the very pretty um orchids what kind are they or whatever and and, and this man's like oh well these are my favorite plants they need so much care and feeding like the negro they you know they they can be beautiful if they're you know if if but if you let them alone to grow wild then weeds prop, pop up and and they just take over the whole garden and we can't have that and the important thing is like oh okay that's whoa all right back back to reality okay so and where were you on the night of blah, blah, blah? And then the, and the, the plantation owner's like, he is not still asking me about where I was after I just told him how he's an orchid and orchids are pretty, but they're stupid. So the man slaps him across the face and Sidney Poitier slaps him right back. It's my favorite moment of the movie in like all of movies. And this was like the slap her round the world. Trust me on this. There was, if there had been social media in 1967, it would have taken over all of social media. There was no social media, but there was news. <laughs> right, right. It made the news. 
it was a slap. Mm -hmm. And guess who had to ask for that slap to be there? Sidney Poitier. Because when they had this little scene set up, that slap was not in there from Sidney Poitier. The slap, Norman, the, 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 the plantation owner slapping Sidney Poitier was in there. But the way in which it was originally written, it's Virgil Tibbs just kind of took it, I guess. And Sidney Poitier went to Norman Jewison and is like, this isn't working for me. Uh, <laughs> Virgil's not just going to take this. Like, I need to slap him back. I just do. And you and just I'm sure did. Were, <laughs> I'm sure there were a lot of discussions in the room, in the writer's yeah. room, about what that was supposed to be gonna mean. And well, yeah, no one will watch this movie in the South. Guess what? They weren't gonna watch it in the South anyway, so you're not exactly losing an audience. So they But they did because of that slap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of people in the North watched it, and, and a lot of black people went to their black theaters to watch that. I just want to see that one part where he slaps him back. Right. <laughs> it was awesome. I love yes. that. I, oh, that's my favorite part of the whole movie. Because it made sense. It totally made sense. It did. He wasn't and... carrying himself like some inferior quote-unquote Negro. He was carrying himself as a man who had every right to walk the earth as a so-called plantation owner. It wasn't a higher form of life, so why would he act that way? Mm. Um, so yeah, he slapped him back, just like you would like if somebody slapped you and you would slap slap them back. He did the same thing, and I love that man's reaction <laughs> because he said, "You know, if this was a different time, I could have you shot." And then he looks at at Gillespie. He's like, "Chief Gillespie, you just saw a colored man." slap a white man now what are you gonna do about that and gillespie's like uh <laughs> hmm let me get back to you about that just got a call gotta go catch a gotta go catch a bad guy see ya let's go virgil <laughs> let's let's keep on a walking you know because you know he'll be he's head of the clan so they'll be getting a call and it's probably not gonna be safe for you here anymore but we're just gonna walk while we still can <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh my god i love 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 this movie and well, anyway, and, and of course, we're taking a long time to get around to what the story is about. But anyway, that's what the story is about. The industrialist was killed. Virgil Tibbs is pressed into service to find out who did it because because the widow wants somebody with some sense to find out who did it. Now, it's of also course, important to mention about the widow and the, the, the victim of, of the murder. They're from Chicago. So with Virgil being from Philadelphia, this woman understands that it's like-mindedness. Mm -hmm. And so she's thinking these people down here, there's already there's already a bias for her because right. they don't because know she's any, a what happened. Bagger. Exactly. So as far as she's concerned, he's on the case. Forget all y'all, because I know y'all ain't gonna do nothing. Right. You're he's on the case. Cover it up. That that's was that it, it up. that's a very important part. She's she, like you said, she's a carpet bagger. She's from the north. Yeah, she, she don't like these people down here. She didn't even want to come down there. Right, and she probably didn't want her husband to build a factory there, but he was probably motivated by some altruistic, you know, well, you know, A, cheap labor. That wasn't, so it wasn't totally altruistic. It's like salaries are a lot lower in the South than they would be in the North. Otherwise, he could have just built the factory in the North. But it's like, but, you know, if we open it up to everybody, we, we won't have a labor shortage. How about right. that? So why would I segregate it to only white people? There aren't enough white people down there. I need workers. So let's open it up to everybody. That yeah. didn't fly too well. Yep, indeed. Um, but anyway, they, anyway, Virgil runs into all kinds of issues. And of course the Klan is called because the plantation owner was the head of the Klan. And, you know, comes within an inch of getting the crap kicked out of him and all that. But he does end up solving the crime. But that's not that's not even the best part of the story. Like you know, he's going to solve the crime from the beginning when the chief tells him, "You you know, you're being volunteered to solve the crime." When he was voluntold to solve the crime, you knew he was going to solve the crime. He's the hero of the story. That's not that's not 
the best part about the movie. The best part about the movie is the reckoning between Chief Gillespie and Virgil Tibbs, because as it turns out, they were two sides of the same coin. They right. were very much alike, alike. both mm -hmm. driven by need for justice. Both of them didn't suffer fools gladly. Both of them had a great work ethic. So, and, you know, so, but they needed, they needed to learn that there were things that they could learn from each other. That was the, that was, that was the aha moment of this movie, to coin a really harried phrase. That was the aha moment for this movie, that two men from such entirely different backgrounds, one clearly a racist, one victimized by racism, clearly, that even with that, even with those huge barriers, that somehow they can come to an understanding on their own and realize that there was far more that brought them together than separated them. That's right. the brilliance of this movie. That's why I love it. That's why in 55 years later, because the movie is 55 years old, or will be this year, this movie still resonates. It does. This movie still has things to teach us, and probably even more now than, than like, say, 30 years ago. Um, because people are just so polarized. How do we come together? Well, this movie kind of shows us a way in which people can come together, even though they're, they're out here. They can come together. There are ways. There are more paths together than there are apart. Correct. That's why I, that's why this movie is one of my favorite movies of all time. It has been and will continue to be. But did you like the film? I love the film. <laughs> what's what's your favorite movie by Sidney Poitier? Uh, In the Heat of the Night. <laughs> Besides that one, we already did that one. Oh, what other movie? Raisin in the yes. Sun. Raising in the Sun, another wonderful film. Um, a man let's who's trying to do. Let's 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 chat it up. Man who's trying to do for his family what he thinks is the right thing. Um, trying to uh, keep his family together in a situation where he's having a hard time keeping work, keeping a job, um, getting a job, trying to get an angle, trying to have a hustle. It's because the job's not necessarily rel uh, present for him to, to, to have. And his family, his wife, child, and his mother trying to keep things together. Um, and all these outside influences doing everything they can indirectly to you know, drive him crazy and, and pull him apart from the family that he loves so much, but at the same time, these things seem like they would be the perfect thing to do to keep the family together, get money, get more wealthy, all those things. And all it is is the devil's due. Here's a guy who's struggling to keep his family together and he's not making right decisions. No, and he wasn't that good a guy. I mean, he was basically an, a good guy, but mm -hmm. he didn't act like a good guy. He was very he was a good guy who was very unhappy. He was very unhappy. About the only thing he didn't do in the movie was cheat on his wife. And you figure like he's just like a soup son away from doing that. <laughs> right, exactly. Because <laughs> cause nothing they did, the family who he loved, nothing they did made him happy. Everything they did, he felt was small. Mm -hmm. And everything he did in his mind, he felt was trying to be big, bigger and get things done. His mother said, just get a job. That'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> right. He wanted to set the world on fire. And the mom's like, well, it's like, you need a job. It's like you can do a lot of things with a job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she kept coming around. And, you know, this plant, this plant that I'm putting outside the window could grow with water. If you could get a job, we'd have plumbing. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just, I mean, I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but uh, the point is, the that point is, happened. the point is, his wife is a lovely woman. She's a wonderful woman, a little subservient, but she loves him with her whole heart. 
his mother is a little, is a stronger woman who loves the the wife but wants the wife to be a little bit more firm and the young the child is just a bubbly kid just out there you know in trying to embrace the world and everything but here's a guy who's who seems to want to do better for the family and ignores the family altogether mm -hmm. and only thing he pays attention to is his friends and people outside saying hey I got this, let's do this. Hey, he, he feels the rhythm of the street. And the rhythm of the street is like, I got you out here. I got your money and I get out of my face. Right, 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 right. It is a really good movie. A it's... lot of wonderful actors and actresses in this movie. Um, and it just, the story itself just draws you in. And all the things that are happening just draw you in. And Ruby D is a is a wonderful presence of a wonderful mother, caring, giving, and seems like she gets nothing in return. <laughs> so it's it's a pretty it's a pretty interesting film. Um, what did you take from Raisin in the Sun? Um, well, I was just looking up. I wanted to see. I couldn't remember who played the mother. See, mm -hmm. I mean, then that was Claudia McNeil, who was just a venerable, another venerable actress, just so powerful. Um, the the cast in this, the casting in this movie is what I liked, but also the writing in this movie. Lorraine Hansberry did the screenplay, and she wrote the original play, which was on Broadway. Sidney Poitier played the role on Broadway, and then he was brought over to do the film. That didn't always happen. There were, and, and even back in those days, a lot of times, even if some, even if the star of the Broadway show, you know, got rave reviews, that Hollywood might decide, well, yeah, but he doesn't have the the right look, or the director didn't get along with the actor, whatever. There could be a million reasons why that actor wasn't brought over, but in, but it worked out for Sidney Poitier. Mm -hmm. Claudia McNeil played the mother, Ruby Dee played his wife, Diana Sands, the amazing Diana Sands, who unfortunately was not blessed with a long life, but she played his sister. Mm -hmm. In the movie, Ivan Dixon played Asagai, who was like the, you know, like the immigrant from Nigeria, who was very much in love with Diana Sands character. She played Benethia, younger. John Fieldler played Mark Linder, and he's another just amazing, just an amazing actor, just character actor. And you probably would know his name, but he played the same like sort of mousy, mousy, sneaky kind of sucker type guy in like countless times. Mm -hmm, in this mm -hmm. instance, he played like a real estate agent who was like extremely nice, except that, you know, he really didn't want them moving into the Chicago neighborhood that was really segregated. And then Louis Gossett was in this movie playing George, George. Murchison, mm -hmm. who was the guy who was, a you know, he was like ready to offer Benethia um, all kinds of boredom if she would only like marry him and wash his clothes and feed his and cook his food then she could just be bored to death being his wife if she would only just understand how amazing what an amazing offer this is mm -hmm. and she's like no you're you're boring me you're boring me george <laughs> uh, so poor sydney poitier who he played ralph younger i think mm -hmm. walter i'm not ralph walter, walter younger, younger. Walter Lee Younger. Mm -hmm. Walter Lee. And Stephen Perry played this played his son Travis. John Fluellen played Bobo. He was in Carmen Jones with Dorothy Dandridge. Another man like the Roy Glenn was in this movie. There were so many just I mean it was like the the pre most prestigious gathering of black actors you could ever pull into one film since the days of King Vidor. Um <laughs> but what I what I was going to say was that it, the real the realism of the situation is that he had poor Sidney Poitier, he's married, he's got a son, but he's got to live with his mother. He's got to live with his sister, you know. 
blah, 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 you're not doing this, you're not doing that, how come you haven't taken care of me, um, how come you want sex, oh god, you know, no, oh my god, the kids can hear, I'm pregnant, what happened, you know, and, and he's, and, and he, I mean, and he comes in like the, like a failure, I mean, he feels like a failure, um, he wants to set the world on fire, but he can't even find a match, so, the whole world on fire thing is really not going that to happen. happen, right? Right. And then his mother, his father dies. And probably after months and months of delays, because again, black people were not being fairly treated. His mother gets a $10,000 payout on her husband's insurance policy. Now in the 1960s, $10,000 was a crap load of money and they get this money. It's like, Oh my God. And, and the way that they're like jumping around and celebrating, you would think that they had won the lottery. Well, they did win the lottery they did. in those days. That was the lottery yeah. because $10,000 could not only put a down payment on a house. They could buy a whole house. You could buy a house for $10,000, a really nice house back in those days, $10,000 would pay for a college education for multiple kids. And you would still have money left over. You could get the appliances that you need. You could get your hair done. It, it, would, it was literally life-changing to get that $10,000. And guess what? You didn't have to pay taxes on it because it was an insurance payout. So it wasn't even treated as income. So you get the whole $10,000. And Sidney Poitier sees this as his, it's like, I want to I wanna set the world on fire, but I just, I just don't have the tools to do it. But with this money, maybe, maybe you got to spend money to make money. Maybe if I, if I can just get like a chance, I can set the world on fire because I'm smart enough. I, I know what to do. I just, I just keep getting blocked. Now I'm not blocked. And that's how the ball starts. Well, the ball really starts rolling when the mother, when the mother, Claudia McNeil, says to Walter, and what is her, her name was Lena. She played Lena younger. So Lena says to Walter, because she knows her son is unhappy. She knows her son feels completely put upon, that he wishes that he could live in, a, that his mother could live in her own house. He and his wife could live in their house, maybe with some soundproofing so that his son wouldn't have to hear them having sex. He wants all this stuff and it's and and he would love to like ditch his sister because the sister talks too much. She knows all this. She sees what's going on. It's not that he doesn't love them. It's just that there's too much. It's too much family. It's kind of like pandemic without the whimsy. So she <laughs> says to him, I want I'm going to entrust you to take care of this money. I'm going to give it to you for safekeeping. And it's it's a really touching moment in the film because from his standpoint, he feels like he feels like his mother is very disappointed in him. And it's just and that's all that she feels for him is just disappointment, mm -hmm. sadness and disappointment, and that she would never ask him to do anything. So when she asked when she says, I'm entrusting you to keep keep this money, you know, we, we need some of it for your sister Benethia's education, because she wants to go to med school. I want to set some of it aside for Travis because he's going to need to go to school too. And I want to put a down payment on a house, you know, so I want you to, you're the man of the family. I want you to hold on to this money for us. And he's like, mama, you would, you would trust me with that. And she's like, yeah, of course you're, you know, you're the man, you're honorable. Of course I would trust you. And he's like, oh, that's, thank you so much, you know, that you believe in me enough to know that I'm not going to screw this up, which, which, which I am, but at least you know mm -hmm. that I'm not going to, at least you don't think I'm going to screw this up, which I am. So, so she gives it to him and he just, I mean, the dreams, the ideas, it's like, oh my God. And of course he can't help but tell his low life friends. Oh yeah. I'm a big man now. I, you know, I, I got some money. I can buy the drinks. You know, I, I can spend a little bit of this here money to, you know, 
get get you get you guys some drinks and treat you all to some lunch, some pork and beans and some some ribs because uh, I'm a big man now because you know we won, <laughs> we won the lottery. And they're like, really? Wow, that's amazing. Hey, hey, Walter, you know Bobo. <laughs> and that's the killer. Hey, Walter. Hey, Walter. <laughs> hey, Walter. hey, Walter Lee. Hey, Walter Lee. Yep. Yeah, you know, I've got this in, this here investment opportunity because you know the man is keeping us down. But if we could invest in like a, like a, um, like some kind of like store, like a like a liquor store maybe, because you know, black people like to buy their liquor. And if we could just give the people what they want, we could be making money hand over fist. That would be amazing. <sighs> Too bad we don't have the money to do that. But wait, but Walter Lee, you, you've got a little bit of what do you think? Like you could be like the head partner. I'll be the silent partner. You be the head partner. You run this whole thing. What do you think? Walter Lee's like, hmm, hmm, makes sense. Black people do like to buy liquor. I know I like to have a drink on a Friday night. Now, what if I wanted to drink on a Friday night, but I didn't have to buy it from the man? What if I could buy it from myself and all my friends bought it and, and their wives? And then when their kids brought, grew up, they, they came and bought and they brought their friends. Wow, wow, I could like create this whole empire for my family not thinking that even if his mother was inclined to invest she would never invest in a liquor store she hated liquor all things <laughs> of all things she thought liquor was the devil which it was but she thought liquor was the devil um so <clears throat> he did not think this through very clearly all he saw were literally dollar signs and also just this opportunity opportunity to be a big man and to be the man it's sort of like he was a legend in his own mind but nobody knew it but him now this was a chance for the rest of the world to find out that he truly was a legend so he's like oh yeah so he basically steals this money he doesn't set anything aside he doesn't set anything aside for his own son because he figures it's coming back i'm just mm -hmm. borrowing the money I'm gonna mm -hmm. borrow the money to invest it. And we're gonna make so much money that Beneath is gonna have more than enough money to go to medical school 20 times over. And Travis is gonna have enough money to fail college as many times as he wants. And there'll still be enough money for his tuition. And we'll get, well, there'll be a plenty of money for the down payment on the house and I can kick my mother out and she can go to the nursing home where she rightfully belongs and life will be good. That's what he was seeing. What he didn't see was his low-life friend Bobo. Because Bobo decides to make off with the money. Bobo, it's like, and it's, you know, like how, like in the information age, we're all concerned about identity theft and, you know, and 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 just fraud and scams and stuff like that. And it's sort of like, you know, you, you know, like your your money's in the bank account. But then one day you look in the bank account and where, you know, $10,000 should be, it's like the only thing you see is zeros. You're like, what, what happened to the money? Where, where is the money? Oh, it's gone. But, 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 well, you know that wire transfer that you approved? Well, it went through and the money's gone. Well, this was like a wire transfer, except really bad because he gave all the money to Bobo because Walter, instead of setting things up on his own, you know how when you get something, when you want something done right, you do it yourself. Well, Walter's mm -hmm. too big of a man to be bothered with the details of actually getting the liquor store, the permits, the land, the, all of this. Bobo's going to take care of that because Bobo's got an in at the permit office. Bobo knows the inspectors. Bobo knows how to get a good deal on a plot of land or to, to buy a, a, an already existing building so that we can set. Bobo knows all that. So let's, let's leave it with Bobo, 
And Bobo's like, well, I need all the money or I'm not going to be able to, you know, I got to spread it around to, you know, like to get people in the corner, in, in our corner. Oh, yeah, that's true. Okay, here's all the money. I can't reach Bobo on the phone. Where is Bobo? Where is Bobo? It's kind of like, where's Waldo without the whimsy? Where is Bobo? And then his other friend's like, well, um, we, we need to talk, Walter. Why? We just, we just need to talk. Just tell me now. Well, you know how Bo, you know Bobo? What about Bobo? Well, well, you know, you know how when you told Bobo that he was supposed to take care of everything and Bobo said he was, and then Bobo said that he knew all the people and he, he was gonna have all the money and spread it all around. Yes, I, I was there when I had the conversation. I know what happened. What happened? Well, Bo Bobo, I don't think Bobo's around. Like Bobo, Bobo left. What do you mean Bobo left? He, he Bobo's gone. What do you mean Bobo's gone? Bobo's, Bobo's gone. He's really, really gone. What? Oh my God, Bobo's gone. Bobo's gone. Well, we, we've got to find him. Yeah, I think Bobo left the state. <laughs> and, Ain't no finding Bobo. <laughs> Ain't no finding Bobo. And that's to be, though, that happens about halfway through the movie. But to be perfectly honest, that's really the beginning of the movie. <laughs> Everything else is a long setup to that moment when Sidney Poitier, Walter Lee is like, oh my God. Now, what am I going to do? Because now I have no money for Beneath His Education, I have no money for my son. I had no money for anything and my mother said she would trust me and she trusted me and I completely, and I mean, it would be hard to draw a picture that would explain as clearly as possible how much I've screwed this up. Like there are no pictures that would show how much I've screwed this up. I've screwed it up so badly. So now what am I gonna do? I, I just wanna run away. And run away is not an operative, not in this situation. You got so much at well, stake. Actually, there, it is an option. He just didn't take it because it's, it's men not, have run not, away for less. It's not a good option. And they women too. That. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't. He knew that wasn't a good option, but people have been in that situation before and they've run away. Yeah. It's a, it's a ridiculously good film. Um, obviously, coming from Broadway to the big screen um, was in itself a wonderful thing. But to have an actor of his caliber take it from the theater to, uh, from the uh, uh, Broadway to the big screen and just gave more and more people an opportunity to see how much a wonderful actor he is. Um, just a, a, a blessing. Uh, and there's so many other films that are just so good. Um, another one that I, I think is really, really good was To Serve With Love. I actually like that movie myself. Me too. Bit. I love that movie too. Um, and the movie that got him the uh, Academy Award, Lilies in the Field, a very interesting film. Um, pretty good film. I think that was probably the first one I'd ever seen. Ooh, okay, I'd like that less and less. <laughs> can we talk? Can we talk about that for a second? To me, this was a classic situation where he won the Academy. He should have won the Academy Award for In the Heat of the Night. In the Heat of the Night, sure. Rod Steiger got the Academy Award for In the Heat of the Night, um, but not Sidney Poitier. Instead, he gets the award for Lilies of the Field, and it's like he shouldn't have won the award for that. He he should have gotten it for this other film. But they it's sort of like they were rewarding him. It's kind of like Whoopi Goldberg got the award in Ghost, and and um, Den Denzel like, Washington. Well, he got in Training Day, so yeah. But that was what I'm alluding to is not as good a film, right? Not as and his and his role in it wasn't as good because I think whatever else. He should have got the Academy Award for he didn't. Now I know he got it the the award for um, Laurie, 
but it just reminds me of that in, of that situation. He got the Academy Award for the lesser film <laughs> as yes. a, as as a well. We're sorry we didn't give you the, give it to you for this, <laughs> so we're gonna give it to you for that. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So um, yeah. So the, I I don't. That's one of my least favorite films of his. But I will just say, just to summarize quickly for me, other favorite. I love sneakers. I loved him in, in Sneakers. I loved him in, um, like you said, To Sir With Love, um, Shoot to Kill, Paris Blues, um, Porgy and Bess, I thought he was amazing. He was Edge very good City. in that. Edge of the City is one of my favorite films. Um, he was really good in Blackboard Jungle, but it's not one of my favorite films. I loved him in The Long Ships with, when he was reunited with Richard Widmark. I was going to say he's actually done quite a few films with Richard Whitmark mm -hmm. and one of the better ones and one of the ones that made me feel even more um, a part of the world as a as a positive, strong black man as he plays this strong black Moore King in the long ships. That was awesome. He was mm -hmm. the man. Yep. And in, at a time again, because that's the early six, uh, mid sixties again, like around 65, 67, that that's not the vision that you would see. That's not right. the persona you would ever typically see from a black actor in the time, especially trying to be in the big films. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about regular major films. So that, that was that was one of those moments. And he also directed Uptown Saturday Night with Bill Cosby and then Let's Do It Again. So and and he and Harry Belafonte got greenlit and appeared in Buck and the Preachers. So he was a man, he he was an actor, yes, but he was also a producer. He was also a director. Um, he was talented in front of and behind the camera. So those are just and and you know, he appeared in fifty five films. You would think from his biography that it was like 155 but no it was just 55 films um but they all just had this huge i mean the most of them had this huge presence i mean there were a couple of lesser films in there for sure but most but his performances were never lesser even if the films were not that great i mean he mm -hmm. made a silk purse out of a sow's ear with lilies of the field i'm sorry he made that film watchable and he did he did but that's the that's the that's the thing it, even even though the film itself wasn't the great film, you were still mesmerized by him being in it. You were still uh, brought in because of his persona in it. Whatever that character was, he made that character more. And that's that's the the essence of this guy. Um, I, Brother John, for example, he he was a commanding force in that film. Um, even the 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 Bedford incident, it's Sydney oh, Portier. Bedford incident. It's Sydney Portier love all the, the way. Incident. Oh my god! Oh yeah, it's a great film. It's a great film, and it's a film where it takes you into the military and this uh, uh, photojournalist out there in a, in a in a situation that you really have to wait till the end to see what really goes on. And then again. He's with Richard Whitmark once again <laughs> in a film, mm -hmm. so he, so you can kind of tell who's friends, right? Um, yep. But but uh, um, just a just a, a a great film, and I too like the edges of the city. It was edgy right from the beginning of the film to the end. That was that's a good film too. Cassavetes, I just Cassavetti. love John Ca John Cassavetes. Um, he is a I great actor. I was going to say that that um, the the Bedford incident definitely there was the movie that um, oh god I can't remember the name of the movie that I'm trying to find it now it was um, Denzel Washington Crimson Tide definitely. Crimson Tide right Crimson Tide owes so much of its pedigree to the Bedford incident because mm -hmm. that sparring like the Clash of the Titans. They took major notes from the Bedford incident. Most definitely, you could see it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. it's it's very clear, very clear. Yeah. Yeah. So just uh, just some some wonderful films, 
uh, and wonderful he just actor. Paved the way for so many actors. Um, he helped his friends, but he paved the way for generations. I mean, pretty much any actor of color, um, you know, they owe a tip of the hat to Sidney Poitier for any success that they that they achieve because we we literally you know we and and i can say this as a former actor we've stood on the shoulders of a giant he was a giant you know um and he will be so sorely missed um but uh, his he is already will be there for the and, for the rest of the time and as great an actor as he shows and then you see any of his films you'll see um, very much an activist, very much into the civil rights movement, very much in trying to help other people gain and, and, and receive better treatment in the world. He was a, 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 just a force that will, as you alluded to, will be, will be uh, sorely missed. Um, yeah, when I when I heard the news, it was uh, took me aback, and, and I realized that Sidney Poitier was uh, as an older gentleman in his nineties. I knew that, but because of how much he's been a part of the world, been a part of the movement, we'll say, been a part of just better films, better acting. I mean, he was such a consummate actor um, and coming from nothing and achieving much and as humble as he always seemed to remain, uh, just a, 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 a big loss. Um, so fortunately we have film to look at, even documentaries to look at that he's been involved in. Yep. Um, I think if you want something to do Go back and look at films of Sidney Poitier. Go back and look at um, documentaries that involve not just Sidney Poitier, but Sidney Poitier in support of civil rights. Um, you'd be surprised at, at what you see. And um, I look forward to reminiscing and re revisiting as many of his films as I can. Me too. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our inaugural episode for the year 2022, for a real point of view. Thanks for joining us. And we hope that you'll continue to join us. Leave us comments on things that you would like to see. And um, we'll definitely take a look at those things and keep bringing you yesteryear, today, and talk about even future films that are coming out. So thanks again for joining us here at A Real Point of View. And thanks, Karen, for hanging out, as always. Um, of and uh, blessings to everybody. And uh, be safe out there. Stay safe out there. Take care. Bye. 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 <laughs>